Well, standing by. At this time, all guests will remain in a listen-only mode for the duration of today's conference. At the end of the presentation, we will hold a question and answer session. And if you'd like to ask a question, you may press star, then one. Today's conference is now being recorded. If you have any you at this time. Turn the conference over to Irene Stricky. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Great. Thank you very much, and welcome everybody to our uh, CFPB Financial Education Exchange webinar this month. Um, we've had a break of a couple months without webinars, so I'm very happy to be uh, resuming um, now uh, with this February webinar, and we're very excited to be doing this on um, fraud prevention for older adults in partnership with our Office for Older Americans. I am joined by guest speaker Erin Scheithe, uh, who will uh, speak after I do a brief intro. Uh, and thank you, everybody, who hopefully picked up on the change in the, the dial-in number. Um, if you're hearing my voice, I guess you you um, you that. So my uh, I, everyone's patience on that. So we'll get started. I just do a few intro slides to begin with to kind of get us all on the same page. First, we have to do our uh, sort of standard uh, disclosure as government employees that, that this presentation is being made by CFPB representatives on behalf of the Bureau, but it does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice, and any opinions stated um, are uh, the presenters and may or may not represent the uh, Bureau of use. So I always get that out of the way. I just quickly uh, note, um, probably most of you know who we are, but we're a federal agency uh, and our mission is to regulate the offering and provision of consumer financial products or services under all consumer financial laws and to educate and empower consumers to make better informed financial decisions. And it's obviously that second half of the mission that we're really talking about today of educating and empowering consumers uh, and then the financial educators who help those consumers um, in our webinar today. Uh, just quickly, um, on the consumer-facing side of the Bureau, uh, uh, the office, the um, Consultation Engagement Division. There are six offices. I represent the Office of Financial Education. Uh, our mission is to educate and empower all consumers to make uh, informed financial decisions. Uh, we work closely with the other offices, especially the Special Population Offices, Financial Empowerment, Older Americans, uh, Service Member Affairs, and Students and Young Consumers. And obviously, it is older Americans who we are um, partnering with today for this call. So. Right, to uh, feature some of their resources on the call today. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Finex, hopefully uh, if you got an email about this webinar, you know what Finex is, but it's the Financial Education Exchange. If any of you are not getting a regular uh, monthly, approximately monthly newsletter called CFPB Finex News and Updates, you should sign up because it uh, will let people know about things such as this webinar and, and other resources that we have. You can do that either by emailing the um, address which is at the bottom of the screen, CFPB underscore Finex, F -I -E -X, at CFPB.gov. You can also go to our website and sign up automatically. I'll do that in a minute. Um, this slide I put up just because it shows some of the cool stuff that happens. Um, we have lots of webinars. Uh, such as what we're doing today. We have in-person convenings. We uh, uh, reach out to financial educators to learn what, what they're doing and whether they like our materials. So um, these are things that um, Finex does, and we hope that you will be interested in, um, in if you are not already part of Finex. Uh, we also have a resources for financial educators page, screenshot up there, where we of course, note the, the the next webinar to come, but we also have all of our different tools and resources for financial educators, and that is where you can sign up automatically. There's a sign-up box there if you want to put your email address in to sign up for Finex if you haven't already. Uh, one fewer step than, uh, than uh, emailing our Finex inbox. And then the uh, last couple things I'll mention is that on that page, um, we have a printable resource inventory. I have a screenshot here that features all of the tools and resources that you can use for free from the Bureau. And I'll just note, for those of you who have, have seen this before or know about it, we did just update it in the last month to include all the links to Spanish language tools. We had had some, but not all in before. So it is now comprehensive in having links to all of the Spanish language tools. So for any of you who are working with uh, 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 folks who's, for whom English is not a first language, it should be easier to find um, to find those tools now that we have made that update. And then the last thing I always say is we also have a uh, education discussion group on LinkedIn. Um, you can also get information about this on our website, but this is the place where we post our material. So I moderate that. I put up new things that come out as they come out, and other people can also put up their materials. So you'll see announcements of webinars or reports or questions from other organizations, including people like all, if you want to join that. and. Um, and participate in that discussion. 
Uh, and again, you can get the link direct to that on that Resources for Financial Educators page. And all the links will be up at the end of this webinar as well, um, uh, if you didn't catch any of that. So that's a standard intro to make sure that everybody uh, knows what's happening. And we will now turn over to our presentation, our presenter. Um, so I will just note that as the operator said, we will um, hold questions, sort of verbal questions till the end, at which point you can open up, we'll open up lines and you can ask verbal questions. But you can send questions through the Q&A function in the webinar if you're within WebEx. Uh, and I will keep an eye on those, and if anything is sort of urgent or needs to be answered right away, uh, I will uh, let her know and she can answer those, or I'll hold them till the end if they feel like they're better for the end. So again, use either the Q&A function or you can wait for the voice questions. So with all of that, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Erin Scheife, and she will talk to about fraud prevention for older adults, a, a, a very important topic. And obviously everything she talks about, a lot of it will certainly be relevant for people of any age because fraud can hit people of any age. So Erin, I am turning it over to you. Thank you much, Irene, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, let's go to the slide that kind of introduces the office for older Americans. We develop initiatives, tools, and resources to help protect older consumers from financial harm and also to help them make sound financial decisions as they age. You can actually learn quite a bit more about the Office for Older Americans at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. So don't go there now. Don't leave the webinar. But uh, later on, when you have some time, check out the variety of resources that we have available. Um, and a little bit further about what we do, um, we really do lead initiatives to help um, protect older people from financial harm. And when I say that, it's something that we're really thinking about right now in our office. Um, we're concerned with um, respecting all older adults. We want to make sure that um, they are participants in this process as well. Um, so we're, we're not just protecting them, we are, as Irene mentioned earlier, we're really empowering them to protect themselves and share this information with their friends and family. We create tools and resources, some of which we'll talk about today, that support um, sound financial decision making that really safeguards their life economic security, which is so important. Many older adults um, whom you work with on fixed incomes or have a finite amount of savings or assets, so that's really important. Um, like all of the other resources that the CFPB offers, we have resources that you can either take a look online and download or order in bulk absolutely for free. So it's a really great service to provide. And next slide, and we'll just talk a little bit about who is at risk. Um, Financial fraud for older Americans is sometimes called um, elder financial exploitation, and so you'll see that um, spring through some of these slides as well. Who's at risk? Really, anybody. Um, anyone can be the victim of financial exploitation or fraud. Um, it crosses all social, educational, and economic boundaries, and in fact, um, if you have a lot of assets, a lot of money, or if your clients do, um, you lose. If you're older adults or you work with older adults who are at the opposite end of that spectrum, who have um, very limited resources, um, that is equally as devastating. Um, in fact, like more so, we find when we do um, research that educated or adult are actually more likely to fall for some of these scams and fraud um, than some of their less educated counterparts or peers. And so um, it really, it, it's for, it's kind of equal opportunity exploitation. Literally anyone can become a victim. So let's take a slide and talk a little bit about why older adults are so often at risk. Um, that's good too. Many older adults have both regular income in the form of a social security payment, maybe a retirement pension, something like that. 
um, or they have accumulated assets, retirement savings, or perhaps um, the asset of their home, which for many people is, is their most important asset. Also, um, trusting and polite. Um, don't get me started on millennials. So um, I think a lot of them are, um, you know, a little bit more um, interested in finding out, you know, oh, what is it that you need? They might talk to someone who calls a little bit longer than um, their younger counterparts. They could be lonely and socially isolated. Many of you know seniors for whom this is not the case. They're surrounded by friends, family. Um, but for many, um, including some pop of that population, like those in widowers or um, LGBT elders, they might be lonely and um, might not have a lot of interaction with people. So that when someone calls to chat with them, um, they're ready and, and you can answer that telephone call. And some older adults are at risk because they're reluctant to report the fraud that a family member, caregiver, or someone else um, they depend on has, uh, has to them. Uh, and so these, these exploiters kind of know that this is something um, that their older counterparts um, would be reluctant to report them, and so that, that means they might um, go for them as target. The next one we'll pass over pretty quickly to the accuser or the abuser, and that's really anyone, um, people both known and unknown to older adults, so family members, friends, and caregivers financial professionals, as well as strangers, early scammers of all types. In fact, um, I'll take a moment to mention a scam that targeted the CFPB ourselves. In fact, the assistant director of the Office for Older Americans um, recently put out a blog, which I encourage you to check out on our website, consumerfinance.gov, where she talks about um, being impersonated um, as part of a scam. Um, older adults were, were being called, told that they'd won a sweepstakes prize of any from a couple of thousand dollars to $50,000. And they were told that they had won this prize and that several other phone calls would follow. Scammer actually pretended to be the assistant director of CFPB's Office for Older Americans, this scammer encouraged the older adult, please, I'm, you know, Google me, I'm a real person, and I'm telling you that I have access to uh, sweepstakes for winnings, and I know that you are on that list, so you should send me to the people asking you to pay these upfront taxes and fees because you're a legitimate winner. And of course, um, those of us who are sitting here terrified by this story right now, um, the CFPB does not have access to lottery or sweepstakes things. It's not under our jurisdiction. Um, and we'll never call the people who you're working with as educators, we'll never call them and tell them that they have won a sweepstakes. So keep that in mind. So it can really be strangers, including people who would appear to be trustworthy, like government agency official. And let's go to the slide. Um, what adults really report the fraud that has happened to them? And, you know, I'm sure you can come up with these. They're, they're common sense. And embarrassment as well as, as loyalty to the, the person who's providing care to them. Uh, maybe fear of retirement or not being believed by the authorities. Certainly there's that fear of being declared incompetent and being placed into a nursing home facility. They may be dependent on the abuser for that care. Maybe denial or they blame themselves or maybe they just don't even realize that they've been scammed. And the next for you, as um, educators, I would just mention that 
there are a couple of ways that you can spot financial abuse. Um, and before I get into the resources that we have that can really um, touch on that, I would just mention that since you are likely in direct service to older adults or really to anyone, as we know, anyone can be a victim of fraud. Look for some signs. Um, if someone seems afraid of a relative or a caregiver, if they um, say money or property is missing, if they suddenly change their behavior in a way that is noticeable to you, definitely um, call the authorities. And I, I'll have a couple of resources at the end of the presentation that can help you do that. I want to talk a little bit about the resources that the CPB has come up with um, that would help you to um, educate older adults around fraud um, and even to um, do it in kind of a, a fun way. <laughs> the first way is with our consumer protection placemat. A couple of years ago, some staff from the CFPB and Meals on Wheels America um, came up with a great idea to, to put basic skin prevention tips and information onto a placemat. There are about two and a half million older adults who are receiving meal um, assistance, meal services, either homebound meal delivery, or they're going into a congregate facility where maybe they're sitting down at a table with a few of their friends. Either way, there's this opportunity to include some education. And these face masks were, were kind of a, an idea that um, some, again, creative folks said, you know, let's try this out and see if, if it works. And boy, has it, it actually has really taken off. Um, our placemats really are um, one of our most popular products. And I'm really excited to report that um, it's actually more than 1.4 million have been ordered and distributed. We now have eight placements in English. Um, three of them are available in Spanish. So for those of you who serve Spanish-speaking populations, we're about to add two more to that tally. So we'll have eight in English, five in Spanish, and um, we release a new placemat about quarterly. So key on um, email so that you can see those when they come out. They are completely free, and so um, they are ordered by Meals on Wheels affiliate site, as banks and credit unions and other financial services providers, native communities, agencies on aging, and other nonprofits. And to um, simply go to consumerfinance.gov placemat. Let's go ahead. I want to tell you a little bit about um, something we're really focused on at the CFP, and that's user testing. We just talk to the people who we are serving um, and asking them if what we've provided to them is on the right track. Um, I think when we come up with resources, sometimes we're so deep into it, we think we know. Um, would be best, and then we either hear from people like you, the people providing services, or hear from consumers themselves that maybe things were, you know, just slightly off or, or at least could be proved in some way. And that's, like I said, that we're really focused on at CFPB. And so that we had done actually a pretty good job with placemats, but again, there is always that room for um, improvement and opportunity to do a little bit more. And learned is that there's a time before a meal begins in a cricket site, or that if you're receiving a homebound um, delivery, uh, where older adults might want to pass them by doing a little something. Um, we came up with game placemats. So our really simple placemats. Um, Go to the the next slide, and you, the solution is on the back side. So we have a word search with some um, whole information about um, scams and fraud, um, and how people can really learn how to spot those. 
We'll go to the slide. With a companion toolkit. Toolkit um, with tips for meal site coordinators and also um, people like yourselves, financial educators who uh, maybe you don't have need for a placemat. This is a large handout. <laughs> There's not about these um, 10 by 14 in handout that says these have to be placemats. So if you can find a different way to use them, as I'm guessing financial institutions, for example, have, um, feel free to order them. Um, and you'll receive a copy of the companion toolkit, or you can download it from our website. And um, we talk to financial institution employers, um, you know, faith-based leaders, others who order the mats, and um, they said they could use a toolkit. So we included a, a very basic and very brief lesson plan on fraud and how to spot it, how to prevent it, um, similar to what I've shared with you today. So with this new um, companion resource, we'll really deep educational impact of these great placemats. I just like off. Um, our graphic designers do such an incredible job. Our latest placemat was released on February 12th, so just a couple weeks ago, and it was on romance scams. Um, so we created a romance scam prevention placemat um, because we know that, like I said, though some of the older adults are really suffering from isolation, and and, um, and so they might fall victim to a scam who is is pretend to be really interested in them. Uh, it's, it's one of the saddest examples of this kind of financial fraud that can happen. Um, but the playmat graphics are cute, so definitely give that one a look. And let's go to the next slide. Um, we have consumerfinance.gov slash placemats. That's how you can order those. And that's um, one of our projects. Our next one on the next slide is a really great program, Money Smart for Older Adults. This is a collaboration between the CFPB and the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And if I'm speaking financial educators, I know that you all know about Money Smart. Um, they have many different um, age groups and they worked with us on this one that is specifically for older adults. And it does focus a lot on um, common issues facing seniors, uh, including how to identify scams. Um, it is an instructor-led curriculum with a resource guide that you hand out to participants. And the curriculum itself is available on the FDIC website, or you can order a print bound copy of the instructor led curriculum and you slice and dice that as much as you'd like. Um, there are a, a whole lot of different lesson plans and you could probably from this curriculum um, in bite sized chunks for you know a year or more to the same group of people. Um, pick out just maybe home contractor scams and talk about that once. Or you can talk about um, IRS scams, especially with tax time coming up. Those are those are big ones. Um, the resource guides are available from the CFPB, and they're available in bulk at no charge. Uh, so you can order 50, or you can order 500, or a thousand of the resource guides, and have them shipped right to you. And participants can really use that resource guide um, as a manual. Um, you know, they get a call from the IRS saying they have an arrest warrant, um, as my mom did um, just yesterday when I was talking to her on the phone. Um, really, she looked in this book to see you know, a reference to something like that. Oh, yes, there is. So we knew it was a scam and did not um, respond to that. We intent about a year ago. Um, added quite a few more scams 
um, added finer points on some of the schemes that um, are becoming a little bit more sophisticated. I think the, the worst part about financial fraud is how smart the scammers are and how they pivot and update and change their scams um, so that they are still able to hook as many people as possible. Um, the content is available in English and Spanish as, as well. Um, and we can talk a little bit about some of the module topics. Um, there is, as mentioned, scams, um, a mention of scams that target homeowners. It's also um, a lot of information around identity theft and medical identity theft. So that's typically around your Medicare or Medicaid ID cards. So that check that out. That was added. Um, there are also scams that target veterans benefits, like the attendance benefit, if any of you are familiar with that, or pension uh, lump sum scams. There's also um, some instruction on how to plan for unexpected life events, um, such as may diminish capacity or, um, you know, that is the, the loss of the ability to really manage finances. These have been doing for a long time. Maybe all of a sudden they're not as, as able to do it. And really, we added information on how to financially prepare for disasters. Next slide. We included um, info around the grandparent scam, um, phantom debt collection, charity scams, um, mortgage assistant rescue. So again, lots and lots. And then the curriculum is really that standalone instructor-led module. Um, but in addition to the instructor guide, there's also a really great PowerPoint as well as that resource guide that I mentioned you can order um, in bulk. And so um, people ask me how involved, I would love to help with something like this, but I just don't know where to start. Money Smart is for older adults is where to start. Anybody, even absolutely no experience in financial education, which would probably be very few of you on this kind of uh, webinar, but not anybody can leave this because we really do take you step by step. Hey, Irene, I accidentally yeah. just hit, clicked twice and jumped over your last slide. Do you want me to go back real quick? Um, sure. If you I'll just show it so people can see it. Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Um, so as I mentioned, we we include um, information on a couple of these scams. Um, for those who don't know, um, the grandparent scam is huge now. Um, happening so often, it's basically where an older adult would receive a phone call from someone. Usually, it's someone posing as a grandchild, but someone posing as a friend or any other kind of relative. And there's usually a lot of background noise, and, and basically they're saying, I'm either in jail, or I'm stuck in a foreign country or I'm, you know, experiencing some kind of emergency situation and need help, please bear money to me this way, or please send, um, you know, Apple iTunes gift cards to me this way, or Target gift cards to me this way. And um, they're pretty convincing. Um, they also happen over email. Um, people can pretend to be sending an email um, from your friend uh, and, you know, older adults will get this email. I'm in, um, you know, Europe on a trip and, and my money stolen by a pickpocket. Can you wire me some money? So, um, really just a lot of different variations on some of these scams. Okay, so now to the Managing Someone Else's Money Guide. Erin, um, before I do that, sorry to interrupt sure. again. Uh, I, we just had a question came in that was very relevant, so I thought I would pose it to you um, okay. from someone uh, saying, I have a client who is the victim of a prize-winning scam. We'll hope it's that CFPB one, CFPB one right. you mentioned, but uh, we have complained to the FTC. Should we also complain to the CFPB? Very good question. Um, so the CFPB does accept claims, um, as the person who asked this question knows. Um, but we accept complaints on financial products and services, not on scams. So what they have already done 
um, is the right course of action to contact the Federal Aid Commission, the FTC. So we always encourage, and that's actually on just about every one of our placemats, and I'll have more information toward the end of the webinar on what else you can do in addition to letting the FTC know that there's a scam out there. Okay. Oh, sorry, someone else just chimed in. <laughs> they says in saying that you can also submit a scam report to the Better Business Bureau scam tracker function, just put that out there. It is a great one too. Um, and in fact, we, um, we encourage you to report it in a couple of different ways. Um, and I'll, um, like I said, I'll mention them a little bit later, but just to, um, you know, when is, you know, taking notes, you can write these down and then we'll have the contact information. But um, if someone is in danger, obviously we would encourage you to call your law enforcement um, 911 if it's immediate danger or just the, the emergency number. Um, and we also encourage you to report it to your state attorney general, um, well as to adult protective services, especially if it's a, a caregiving or um, a situation where someone is, is taken advantage of by someone who's supposed to be helping them everyday tasks. Um, so I'll get you those contact information um, the numbers and, and websites in a couple of slides. Okay, um, so managing someone else's money guides are a, a really great way to prevent fraud. And it's maybe at first glance you wouldn't think of them that way, um, but fraud can happen both intentionally in a scam um, and also unintentionally. If you are serving as an agent under power of attorney for a, an older family member and you're not quite sure how to do it, you could do it wrong and then place that person um, under you know, the victim of, of a fraud. So definitely check out these Managing Someone Else's Money Guides if you have clients who are uh, considering signing over um, some of their financial responsibility to a, a caregiver, a financial caregiver. So our guides for four common types of financial caregiver mentioned um, the power of attorney, the guardian and servitors, trustees, and the fourth one is um, Social Security or VA representatives. So, for example, if someone has um, an incapacity, um, if they maybe have dementia or if they're really otherwise um, incapacitated, they might have someone else receiving their Social Security disability or retirement benefits for them. Um, so we encourage people to protect their assets from and scams. Um, these are available in English and Spanish as well. So they're great financial caregivers. They have a lot of other great tips. And, and very pleased to report that today, earlier this afternoon, we released the final uh, six state-specific someone else's money guides that we have um, been working on for the last several years. So if you are living in one of the six states, uh, including Arizona, which just launched today, Arizona. Florida, Illinois, Oregon, and there's one, and I can't remember, but um, definitely check them out on our website, uh, consumerfinance.gov, managing someone else's money. You'll get that way. So the next one, we um, alluded to on our website a lot of additional resources that we probably, um, you know, don't have enough time to, to discuss, even if we just focused on um, just telling you a brief amount about them. We have consumer advisories on um, reverse mortgage um, adding. We have um, a current advisory around lump sum pension payouts and what you need to be careful of if you are interested in those or if your clients are interested in those as well as resources for um, 
practitioners like yourselves. So definitely check out our website and um, take a look at those. Let's go to the next slide. What I would like to mention, it's a little bit um, off our topic, but it's something that we've done that's really cool and I think it's always worth mentioning, with the Planning for Retirement tool. This is an online, really super easy to use tool. You answer a couple of questions um, and don't hang to that information. As soon as you complete the tool, that information is, is scuffed. But you can use this or you can recommend that the people you work with use this tool. Now, when would be the best time for um, an individual to claim their Social Security retirement benefits? Um, for those of you who are working with older adults, you know that there are a couple of points that happen at different ages. 60, which is that first age of eligibility for retirement benefits from Social Security. Um, retirement age, which kind of is a, a sliding scale on the way up to 67. And then um, a Social Security retirement benefit claim um, to 70 is an option. And so, um, especially those of you who work with low resource older adults, um, this decision can, can make or break their later life financial security. Um, they're able to hold out as long as possible. They will receive a larger benefit um, for the rest of their lives. And it's, a, it's an interesting decision um, in that a lot of time, a lot of research has been spent um, on this. And we created this tool really with the support of the Social Security Administration. So um, they've, they've said it passes the muster with them too. So definitely check that out. And um, again, on our webpage, we have information not just about fraud, scams, um, and financial caregiving, but also about managing debt in retirement or um, after maybe regular income has ceased. So for those of you who are serving clients with a, a heavy load of debt so in this age group, um, check out those resources. They um, are usually just more specific to that population, so they may be helpful to um, also have a lot of resources on reverse mortgages which are a products that are really specifically for adults 62 and older. There's a product that was created in the state to kind of take advantage of the boom where, you know, maybe you're for someone you know has purchased a home for just, you know, $50,000 and then years where it increased so much in value, but to sell it in order to tap into that equity. Um, a reverse mortgage gives owners a way to turn their asset of their home into equity. It's a very complicated product. It is definitely not for everyone. There are a lot of risks as well as a lot of benefits to it. So uh, anyone who applies for a reverse mortgage is required to go through counseling with a certified HUD approved housing counselor. Um, if you have you're serving who are interested in this uh, or who have um, mentioned it as something that they might want to find out more about, we still have a ton of resources um, to be able to help them. So I always like to, to mention those. There are scams associated with reverse mortgages as well. So um, the more information a, a homeowner 62 and older can get, really the better. Okay, next slide has my contact information as well as the contact information. Oh, just kidding, I added those slides, I forgot. Uh, so what you can do to help. So if you are working with older adults and you have noticed um, that they may be have fallen victim to one of these frauds or scams, I mentioned earlier that you can call Adult Protective Services, um, can find your local APS, by going to eldercare.gov, calling 
677-1116. And you head into um, your, your web search engine as well, and you'll be able to find your local chapter or local office of Adult Protective Services. Um, and earlier, if someone is in danger or a crime has been committed, definitely call your local police at 911 if it's a very emergent situation. Um, and the non-emergency number if um, no one's life is at risk. You can report and um, really encourage you to report frauds and scams to your state attorney general. You can the National Association of Attorneys General's website, which is naag.org, and you'll find your state attorney general that way. Next, um, you can submit scams to Federal Trade Commission at ftc.gov. We work with them regularly. We're always um, updating each other on, on what we have going on, and so they always um, thank us for encouraging that people really report scams to them. That's the only way we'll find out about them. It's the only way we can create educational resources to prevent them. So please do um, submit those scams to the FTC at ftc.gov. You can mail fraud to the U.S. Postal Inspection Service at usps.gov. So um, are working with someone who has received something in the mail that seems like a scam fraud, usually those sweepstakes or lottery winning pieces of mail, definitely report to report that to the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. And if there's a financial um, product or service that is giving a home to someone who you work with, um, consumers um, can submit a complaint to the CFPB website, consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. Give us a call. Um, our number is toll free 855 CFPB, which is 2372. And we have other ways um, for those who have um, hearing impairments as well. So go to our website, consumerfinance.gov. And I think that, that's it for me. I will turn it back to you. Yes, thank you. That was fabulous, Erin. Lots of wonderful information there. Um, uh, I'm going to Ask the operator to give instructions on verbal questions, then I'm going to say something about the PowerPoint people have asked for. But let's have the operator tell everybody how to ask a, uh, a, a voice question in addition to, of course, the Q&A function on WebEx. Operator? Thank you. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question over the phone lines, please press star, then one, and record your first and last name clearly when prompted. Again, it's star, then one, if you'd like to ask a question over the phone. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And the operator will open line if you do that. So um, while we're waiting for any voice questions to come in, and again, you can also continue to send them to the Q&A function in the WebEx, um, uh, a number of people have asked, and they always ask in these webinars, if they could get a copy of the presentation afterwards. The answer is yes. Um, um, but I need you to email the FinEx inbox. The reason is if you email me through this system, the WebEx system, when we turn it off, all that goes away, and I don't have a record of who reached out to me since I, I can't really write all that down as I'm trying to manage all this. So if you want the PowerPoint, and a few of you have already done this, yay, uh, send an email to, um, in fact, let me go to the next slide in case you're watching because that's got the address. You can see there's CFPB underscore FinEx at CFPB.gov. Uh, if you send me that email and just say, I'd like the PowerPoint, I will uh, send you a PDF of that PowerPoint um, today or tomorrow. Um, so that is available. And then also, as we noted, this was at the beginning, the operator noted that this was being recorded. It takes a couple weeks, but there will then be a recording and also a transcript that you can read, obviously, posted on the financial education um, website, the consumerfinance.gov adult-financial-education. Um, so you can uh, also, again, watch this uh, recording again or read the transcript uh, if that is useful. So again, again Recording and transcript will be available in a couple of weeks, um, and uh, you can request the presentation um, right away by emailing the FinEx inbox um, 
either right now or after the webinar. So let me pause and ask our operator, do we have any voice questions for Aaron? There are since at this time, but as a reminder, please press star then one if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, great, and I don't see any um, emailed questions. Erin, uh, let me just ask you something um, okay. to make the distinction, because I actually, when I'm out talking to financial educators, I often uh, w will kind of get something that kind of gets at this point, which, which you raised, which is that um, uh, the CFPB handles complaints around products. So if you get a, a product that in some way is um, not working or is, you know, doing something fraudulent, but a scam, since there's not a product involved, such as you've won the lottery, right, there's not a bank account, there's not a, a mortgage involved. Um, that's why the FTC handles those complaints. We handle complaints related to products. So that's kind of the distinction. Um, they're all complaints. They're all important complaints, but they go to a different place. Um, but is it true also that if they do call us with a scam, we will refer them to FTC? So it will always yeah. be a first point. Is that just wanted to clarify that? Yeah, and, and I would say, I mean, it never hurts to submit um, a complaint to the CFPB first if that's what you know best. Um, you will, the, the people who accept those um, complaints both over the phone and online, they will absolutely um, refer you to the CF or to the FTC um, they might refer you to um, if, if a, a product like a reverse mortgage or um, like a, a pension lump sum payout. You know, if it does seem to be kind of about a product, but you're not sure, um, don't hesitate to submit it um, because we will make sure that in our resolution, um, you we give you further information on how you can. Um, how you support it to the to the right authority. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually do have. I'll check again for voice questions in a minute. But um, I do another uh, question that came in, or or Q and A question, uh, which says, uh, "Do you see older adults having more trouble when their information might have been stolen in a company's data breach?" Obviously, that's obviously very timely. Do you have any suggestions for educating older adults about the dangers of data breaches? Great question. What do you, what do you think? Great question. Um, I think that this, I don't know that there is any research out yet since we've, um, you know, just some recent data breaches, but I don't know that there's research um, to suggest that it's worse for older adults. Um, I think that may be a, a piece of data or a way to kind of cut the data um, hasn't been fully explored to the to the level it should be. Also, it's usually voluntary, so a lot of people don't reveal how old they are when they're, um, you know, talking about their experience with um, with a data breach. I know that, um, for example, complaints to the CFPB, we ask for your age, but we don't always get it. So we know that this is a certain about a percent or so of our complaints are from older adults. We think it's actually quite a bit more, but they're just not saying. Um, so I'm not sure we have that data. I don't have it, um, at least. We can certainly look into it. Um, and so the case would be very much the same as it is um, for anyone um, who's on, um, or even those who aren't, you know, those who are just going to, um, they're just, the way that, that everyone is supposed to in, in this kind of cycle of credit. So um, the advice is always just to keep your information really safe and secure um, and to check your annual credit report each year. And actually something that, um, that I do is there are three credit reporting agencies. You get a free copy from each of them. And why don't you do it? Every four months. Um, just to kind of keep an eye on it. So every month, um, I have a tickler in my personal, com you know, calendar that says check your report with this credit reporting agency, and then four months later, I check with their one. Um, so I always suggest that just because they're popping up a lot more often than they used to, annually might not be enough. Uh, only credit monitoring um, companies are targeting older adults. I don't want to name any brand names, but we've kind of all seen those commercials where they might be 
and focusing a bit of their marketing efforts on um, older adults. Um, so just like with with that, I would just really caution one from from paying for a service that might be free otherwise, um, or just to really do their do, due diligence on the the credit monitoring or credit um, you know kind of locking service they are working with. Great, thanks, Erin. And I, I just will, would note, just kind of, uh, um, that uh, while there may be no difference in uh, how older adults may be affected or how frequently they may have their data breached, I assume for some it might be, as you pointed out earlier, a harder thing for them to to manage, just for reasons that earlier around kind of decline or you know social social isolation that might prevent them from from getting help they need. So. It potentially have a bigger impact if they're not able to to, to cope with it. But just, I'm just I'm speculating yeah. there. Yes, that's um, that's probably a, a wise question. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, let me ask the operator. Do we have any um, have any voice questions come in? Yes, yeah, we do have a question coming in from Verna Hunter. Ma'am, your line is open. Or will we receive a certificate that we were on the webinar today? So we have not. We've had this question before. We have not gone through the process of, of uh, to get to get continuing education credits. Usually, the accrediting agency or the agency that um, you're providing those to has to okay an activity to be a continuing education activity. Um, and we have not, uh, in general, with Finex, uh, gone to any of those agencies and asked. Um, so that's something that would be interesting to pursue. Um, I mean, I can. I can say you were on it, but I don't know that that would be accepted um, as a CU without that organization agreeing ahead of time. So that's maybe not the perfect answer, but um, uh, that's the kind of situation as it is now. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Morris Armstrong. So your line is open. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, you mentioned earlier that the older, male, well-educated adult is more susceptible to scams, and I don't know if you had any breakdown on other, you know, by story. Not necessarily more susceptible, um, just that we have research to suggest that um, our scams are reported that they have that that group has become a victim. Um, okay, so they're so, more aggressive in reporting. Perhaps okay. they are more aggressive in reporting. Um, it's certainly, um, the, and I look up the source. Um, if you send an email to the Finex box, I can certainly um, cite where I'm getting this um, information from. But it's, um, and it was, I believe, an AARP study that was done several years ago. Um, but it's just to kind of create the point that it literally can happen to anyone. And so we, we hesitate to um, single out people who have had, um, you know, resources or um, maybe less access to um, education. Um, it can really happen to anyone. You know, I'd be happy to get that source for you. I was going to say, I'm an enrolled agent, and I have my little own uh, RA, Registered Investment Advisory Group. And we hear stories of people with, Okay, those or the you know past their sixty who fall for the dating scams to the fifty seventy five thousand dollars, yeah, and then they're reluctant to uh, um, report it to the authorities, but you have to. Um, and the old would have been a tax deduction, but it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it happens like I said at any age and. and Anything that um, or that wealth makes you impervious. You're exactly happen to anyone. Well, thanks. Great. Thanks. Um, had one other um, question via via the Q and A function. I will read to you, Erin. Um, if we reach out to Adult Protective Services, how can they usually help the older adult who has been taken advantage of? Is there a process in place for that? Um, many APS offices um, have processes in place. Um, they're going to be 
probably, you know, almost many are the, the process will be different. So, um, so I can say that they follow the exact same um, same process each time, but um, they will investigate it um, to the level that they're able to. Of course, some of them have more resources um, than others available to investigate these kinds of things. So that's another reason why I can't really say exactly what they would do. It would really depend on the individual APS office. But one thing that the Office for Older Americans at the CFPB is doing is helping to create networks of uh, interested parties in elder financial exploitation. So we're gathering together uh, AP, local APS offices with area agencies on aging and uh, law enforcement, as well as nonprofit partners. And we're getting these networks together, um, helping them to get them together or showcasing the networks that are really doing this right um, so that they can participate in um, the resolution of some of these cases. Um, if you're interested in our network study um, or in setting up a network of your own in your local area, definitely go to our website, um, our Older Americans page. We have information about that network study. Great. And just um, somebody, uh, one of the participants uh, looked up the study, I think, that your fact came from, yes. um, which you can Paul, see if you look on the, the in the chat section, but it's reducing investment fraud in the U.S., developing a fraud prevention curriculum based on the science of social influence. Sounds very interesting. Uh, a FINRA AARP study used to yeah. develop their outstanding investment fraud curriculum, and the, the uh, link is there. So thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, um, thank you. Lynn, um, uh, let's see. We're right at time. Let me just quickly see. Are there any final voice questions, Breeder? Depends at this time. Okay, great. It looks like we're we're uh, uh, answered all the questions that came into the Q and A function, and it's 4 p.m. So we're right on time. So, Erin, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful, and a lot of really valuable information. I'll just repeat that again. Recording and transcript will be available in a, a couple weeks. Uh, the slides are available if you email cfpb underscore fix at cfpb com and um, request the slides, and I will. Some of you, and I see a lot of you have already done that, so that's great. So thank you so much. I hope this is useful. Um, I have looked through that uh, the guide for for uh, for older adults on fraud prevention, the Money Smart Guide, and it's it's um, accessible and readable and interesting, and I think uh, be a good resource for those of you who want to work for your uh, for your clients and the people you work with. So thank you so much, Erin. Thank you everyone for joining us, and hopefully we will have you all back on a uh, future Finex webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.